evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Horace, and this is Huey. Hey, hey, hold up a minute, man. Why you get top billing? You what? You heard me, Whitey. Black people are dissatisfied. They're dissatisfied not only with the white man, but they're dissatisfied with these Negroes who have been sitting around here posing as leaders and spokesmen for black people and actually making the problem worse instead of making the problem better. If he just worked with a white puppet, he could have made a million dollars, but he just wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Nope. Uh, I don't understand the, the big deal about Horace and Huey, this skinny white guy working with a darky doll. Even if at first you, you were like, what the? and get all shocked, eventually you'd be laughing right along with them because they would always be able to bring it back around to just being funny. Unknown today, and underappreciated in their time, Horace and Huey broke through comedic and racial barriers as the first integrated ventriloquist team. Born in this one-room shack to a single mother in 1927, Horace Woods lived a seemingly happy childhood until an undisclosed family trauma at age 10 caused Horace to stop speaking. No one reportedly heard Horace say another word until he resurfaced in the Harlem nightclubs in 1947, working as a ventriloquist opposite Huey, his colored puppet. The pair quickly made a name for themselves as a talented and racially dangerous duo. There was one thing that uh, he used to say that I know a lot of people had a lot of trouble with. But I mean, every time he said it, I mean, the whole place just just went nuts. And uh, it was just two words. And uh, Huey would say it after uh, Boris would say something that Huey found to be ridiculous. And, you know, Huey would cock his head towards the side and his eyes would get all big. And he'd go, nigga, please. And man, I'm gonna tell you right now, you, you just to see the look on the people's face when, when he said that, it was just amazing. Here was the 50s, when the so-called Negro had no voice. They were looking for a voice of truth. What you have to realize is that we're living in the United Snakes of America. Nowadays, we all know names like Malcolm, Martin, Stokely Carmichael. But when you say Huey, people are like, now that's a damn shame. Overrated. You, I mean, that's the perfect term. I mean, like I said, you know, my granddad guys like him and his contemporaries, they're putting their time in, they're doing things. And this, this was a trick. This was a gimmick. It was, you know, some skinny white guy and, and a darky doll. And, you, you know, I, I could go on stage right now with a monkey on my knee. Now, does that make me a genius? No, I don't think so. I remember one time I doubled book, so I recommended Horace and Huey for the gig. Uh, I didn't think the cruise ship would have any trouble with an interracial act. You know, it never even crossed my mind. But uh, that's when I heard an opening night uh, out on the, on the ship, full house, curtain goes up. Nobody had seen Huey till this time. Curtain goes up, and yeah, there was Huey. Right? And uh, curtain came down, and I heard uh, he had to swim back to shore. I swear, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a white dude, skinny little white dude, with what appeared to be a black child sitting on his knee. And the black child, and the black voice was coming out the white dude's mouth, but his lips wasn't moving. One time, they, they got into it so good, both of them was talking at the same time. My granddaddy, uh, of course, uh, him and his dummy were uh, Jasper White and Skeeter. And, uh, and they were headliners. And, you know, I like thinking, you know, maybe the biggest headliners. They did the whole circuit ever, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida. I mean, everywhere, you name it, they played it. And uh, they were just in monster demand. All these various, uh, you know, civic groups, organ local organizations of fraternal orders and, you know, different sort of clubs, private clubs, uh, you, you might want to call it. Uh, for various functions, they were always hiring them. You know, they stayed booked, uh, you know, 24-7 pretty much. Horace is the one that got me involved in ventriloquism. I wanted to tell jokes, but I couldn't, I didn't have the guts to go on stage and do it, you know? So uh, I was working in a club down in South Carolina and I saw Horace and Huey down there. I said, oh, I'm gonna try this to do my, uh, my jokes. In the 50s, I used to come around the park and 
I remember one day, uh, it was a big crowd, biggest crowd I've ever seen. And uh, I couldn't even see what was going on because of the number of people. But uh, I noticed everybody was laughing, even the pickpockets. Now, when pickpockets, I mean, they always work the crowds, but when they're laughing too, you know the dude gotta be funny. But Horace and Huey's success in the parks was short-lived, shut out of playing restricted nightclubs and harassed by police during public performances. The duo had fallen on hard times. White America didn't want to hear from the black man. You know, they, they didn't want to hear what the black man had to say. We were like a voice crying in the wilderness for freedom and justice. But here you have a white man using a black doll as his mouthpiece, speaking out ironically against the white man. So you had all these handkerchief-headed so-called Uncle Tom Negroes who didn't want to participate in the struggle. But here was little Huey, who didn't hesitate in throwing his little body into the fray. As the malaise of the 50s gave way to the volatility of the 60s, Horace and Huey turned ventriloquism into class warfare. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on stag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. There were a few black people who didn't appreciate what was going on. Here you have a white man with his hand up a black dude's ass, talking like a black man, uh, not necessarily saying black things. An eye for an eye and a life for a life. Rebellions that we see are merely dress rehearsals for the revolution that's to come. That's to come. That's to come. That's to come. The revolution will not be televised. Ah, the, the very famous, the, the whistling incident. It's well known that Huey and Horace perform a whistling act. While Horace would drink a glass of water, Huey whistled simultaneously. Well, I, I think it was uh, down in Alabama, uh, my granddaddy headlining the show as usual, him and Skeeter on the bill, c closing things out. And uh, Horace and Huey, I don't even know where they were on the bill, but they were there. It was a big, big show, like I said. And uh, there was this uh, big, buxom, corn-fed country girl right in the front who uh, also happened to be the sheriff's uh, daughter and uh, she got up to go to the bathroom and, uh, and, and Huey whistled at her. Well, first of all, who gets up to leave during the grand finale? That's what I want to know. You know, and I, this is Alabama and, and Alabama at that time, it didn't matter colored fellow, real or wooden, didn't matter. You were not allowed to as much as glance at a white woman, much less whistle or make advances, and so uh, that's why Huey spent the night in jail. Had to be a conspiracy. They did anything they could to take this couple, this, this duo down, man. This is how dangerous they were. People said, well, maybe he was, uh, that was part of the act, or he was whistling for a waiter, or he wasn't even whistling at her, and you know, that ain't what my granddaddy said, and they locked his little colored ass up. They were such a threat to the fabric of the, of, of the white racist system. It was deep. On July 26, 1962, Horace Wood's body was found in his Harlem flat. Cause of death was undetermined, and the coroner's report was never made public. Some say uh, Horace died of a heroin overdose. Uh, or was uh, killed by the KKK, but uh, I personally think it was uh, from hitting the rag. Yeah, that's uh, sniffing wood varnish, you know? As I say, hitting the rag, that's what they say, a term of the trade. Is that what it is? That's what it is. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, the Big H didn't get a hold of Horace, because I remember a lot of times after shows, uh, he'd walk off with the drug dealer. The saddest thing was, though, near the end, uh, I heard that uh, Horace had to, had to take you into a pawn shop. I mean, when you have to sell the, your act, I mean, that is the last, the last move you can make. Once you walk in a pawn shop with, with your life in your hand and give it up, that's the end right there. You start rolling the credits. They were genius. Well, do you see that in the history books? No, you don't see that anywhere. You don't see that on TV. How is it that Elvis Presley was on all the late night shows? What's the dude with the big shoulders and the no neck? What's that cracker's name? Ed Sullivan. 
Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan. How was it that Elvis on Ed Sullivan and Huey and Horace was never on Ed Sullivan? That, you ever ask yourself that? Horace was able to, to have that voice because it was in him, you know? If you say nigga, he'll turn around. Be that as it may, these good people didn't come here tonight to hear you. You think these people don't know what's going on, man? I'm not sure I know. We're all puppets, man, all of us. Somebody's got their hand up your ass. Somebody's pulling your strings. And you can rest assured that it's a white man pulling that goddamn string. Oh, that's right. Some cracker-ass man is eating beach blanket bingo watching motherfucker pulling them strings. Yui. I just don't know what I'm going to do with you.